you doing, Brian? Good, good, good to have you back. Um, today we're going to talk about how to avoid the common disability application mistakes, and this topic was brought to me by Carl. Um, Carl, you have represented or been in and around over 25,000 Social Security disability cases, and I found it uh, frankly rather intriguing when you pointed out to me the other day that you know you said hey there's some just some common mistakes that people are making that can just totally kill their chances for ever getting their case approved and maybe we should talk about it and let your audience know about it so um, I, I thank you for coming out and spending the time today to um, you know to help our people get their application straight so thanks well glad to be of help and you know, I suppose uh, partly uh, since I end up uh, talking with a lot of the people who um, who've received ALJ denials and and are looking at possible appeals into appeals council or federal court. That I suppose I have some selfish motives here, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, kind of my mantra you know, the way I talk to claimants about this is that, you know, our job as representatives and your job on your own behalf if you're a claimant that's listening to this is to, to either win the case in the first place or make the judge look stupid turning you down. That's my yeah. little saying here. So that's what we're going to try and talk about here today. First and foremost is that some of the problems with these forms uh, could, if they were corrected, could just lead to a win. You know, so that's really the number one thing. But you know, secondarily, we all know uh, that not every case is going to win, and so we want to make sure we've built in uh, good information into these files, uh, uh, so that the, the the federal court or appeal aspect of this, uh, you know, is protected. Okay. Well. Here's what I want to do to set the stage. Uh, I expect most of the people that are listening to this interview are relatively new to the process um, and don't have a good grasp at all the levels um, that we have, the administrative all the way up to the federal. So <clears throat> let's cover that to start with. Now, you correct me if I'm wrong because you're the resident expert. Um, so when somebody goes through and they submit their first application, that's their initial application, that's what these forms are pertaining to. Now, even if you do it right, there's no guarantees you're going to get approved, um, like 40 some odd percent do. The next level of possible appeal is called reconsideration, and that is not in every state. What is it, five or seven states that don't have that now? Something like I that. Think uh, ten? I, I think it's 10. I think it's 10. To be honest, I, I couldn't even tell you what the other nine are. I, I just happen to know I'm here in Pennsylvania. I'm in one of them. Okay. Uh, it may be less than 10, but I, th I actually think it is about 10 states that where you skip the recon level and go straight to a, to a hearing. Okay. And the recon, there's not many that are approved at that, so skipping it, it's like, you know, from what I've understood, like 5 7% get approved there. So if you don't get approved at recon, the second level, then you go to a hearing, which is what most people are familiar with. They've got to go to court. Um, and your case is heard in front of an ALJ. Now, if it is denied at that level, you can then go to what's called the Appeals Council. And the Appeals Council is basically saying that the judge has done something wrong. Am I correct? You mean what we, we have to try to prove to the Appeals Council is that the judge has done something wrong? OK, thank you. So if it doesn't get approved at the Appeals Council, the last stop in the process is bringing it to the federal appeals process. That's correct. And, and at that point, what you're doing is you're suing Social Security for your benefits. OK. So the last stop on this is federal appeals. And there's, uh, there's very few people in the country that I know that do this work. And the best person that I've found that does this work is you unmodestly. And it's well deserving of the success that you've had in this arena. So uh, for, for all of you out there that are listening to this, you've got all these different levels of possible approval. But uh, you don't want the case to end up in Carl's hands. But God forbid that it does. Um, what we want to help you understand is that if you have done what we're going to share with you uh, today, 
uh, correctly and how to fill these forms that when Carl takes a look at your case, he can, he, he's got a shot at winning it. Now, if you're like a lot of people out there and uh, maybe we've caught you too late, God forbid, um, or you don't follow what we say and you use the, the term that I have borrowed from you for like five years, Carl, the diner wisdom philosophy of, uh, of, of applying, yeah. <laughs> which is basically just taking a wild ass guess at filling out the forms um, and you don't do it right, then you know when you get and you try to present your case to have somebody like Carl take it uh, and clean it up, it's just really difficult. So can be. I mean, here's the thing. Be. Used to be back in the day that, uh, and we'll obviously be talking more specifically about the particular forms in a minute. But uh, but these these uh, 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 function forms and work history forms, historically, back in the old days, uh, nobody ever looked at them except for the people at the initial or recon level. So in mm -hmm. other words, when you were in front of a judge, uh, rarely did anything you said or didn't say in those forms ever become an issue at all because judges frankly just by and large didn't even look at them. Uh, that's changed considerably. In fact, uh, you know, you might say frankly that judges go looking for stuff. And so uh, what we're going to try and talk about today is, you know, making sure these forms contain complete information so that and, and straightforward information so that that's less likely to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, before we get on to the forms, can we talk about what somebody's options are when they get to the federal appeals level? Because th there is an option that they could, you know, that they could not go forward with their current case, correct? And then they could, you know, double down and not double down, but they could they could start a new application. Is that correct? That's correct. For sure, and 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 you know, to, you know, and to remembering the process, you know, the the initial and usually recon ALJ and appeals council have all said no. By the time that we're talking about a federal court case, mm -hmm. and a federal court case is basically what we're what we're trying to show in a federal court case is that the the ALJ made significant errors either of fact or of law which justify the court uh, looking at it and either granting a new hearing that's the most common outcome when it's favorable uh, or sometimes even outright awarding benefits but the thing that people have to understand is that you know it's almost really a presumption when you go into federal court it's sort of like Missouri okay the district court uh, is a show me state Okay, it, it, you're presumed to be wrong until you convince them that you're right, because the the district courts are not there to sort of second guess or be Monday morning quarterbacks or render their own opinion about a claimant's disability. They're just there to decide whether the judge made serious errors in how he made or she made uh, his this uh, or her decision. Mm -hmm. So that my point in saying all that is that you know I look at a lot of potential federal court cases uh, and probably choose somewhere, depending on the referral source, uh, probably take 10 to 20 percent of those cases into court because of that presumption. Uh, it's not legal error for the judge to be wrong, in other words. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a, a judge's decision does not have to be right in the eyes of God, so to speak, and I don't say that in any kind of disrespectful way. My point is, he doesn't really have to be right in some ultimate sense. He just has to be right enough. Okay. Yeah, so 10 to 20 percent. So is that's what, you know, the, the others that you see, the 80 or 90 percent that you don't take, um, are those, a lot of those falling into, you know, the conversation that we're talking about today, or are there other major reasons why you choose not to take them or are not able to take them? Well, it's, it's probably a little more complicated than that. I would just, I would say it this way, that because the presumption is that, you know, the judges, the Social Security judges, that they're, they get paid the big money to make decisions in cases. Mm -hmm. Since the court's not there to be 
again, a Monday morning quarterback or to simply second guess what the Social Security judges did, it's kind of almost by definition uh, favors what the ALJ, the Social Security judge did in his decision. So uh, part of the reason why we take only 10 or 20 percent is simply that uh, they are what I call coin toss cases. In other words, cases that could have gone either way. And if, mm -hmm. uh, if on the evidence and everything else in a file, uh, a case could reasonably go either way, uh, that's not a good appeal. Uh, another way of saying all this is that in order to take a federal court case, the, the standard isn't that the judge could have found in that client's, in that claimant's favor, but really more like that he should have. And okay. so, just by definition, this this is going to winnow out uh, a large percentage of cases that, you know, frankly, you know, uh, on any given day might have been successful, depending on who the judge was, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, but again, the judge's job is to make these decisions, and the federal courts aren't there to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, second guess them just based on their own personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would say, finally, that the answer is that, yes, I think that some of this has to do with um, the way judges look at files now and, and some of what we're trying to accomplish here today with respect to um, how these forms are completed does have to do with at least taking away some of the ability judges have in cases to say uh, that claimants, for instance, uh, contradicted themselves by saying one thing on a form and then saying something different uh, in the hearing. Takes the gray area out of it. Uh, it. It's one piece of the puzzle, but it's very important, though, I think. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, two things before we get on to the, to the, you know, the going through the forms. One, one is, um, you know, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, okay, what's the big deal? I'll just start all over again. Well, um, I think the biggest reason why you want to get your application done uh, the first time right is to avoid the delay. That's one. But there's a financial reason because um, you want to make sure that you're insured um, and you want to you know, get as much of the back benefits as you can. And if you go through and fight the process um, and then you go to start over again, there could be um, a, quest a question. You could be still vulnerable and not be insured for your Social Security disability benefits. Um, I don't know if you can explain that any better than what I did, Carl, but I just I guess what I'm emphasizing is <laughs> get get the money that's entitled to you and just do it right. Well, that's right. If you refile instead of appeal, uh, that certainly in most cases uh, can be a reasonable uh, decision. And in fact, like as I've just said, in, in the cases I look at, 80 or 90 percent of the time, that's really what we are advising. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but going forward with the appeal uh, preserves the largest amount of back money because if you refile, then you've basically conceded that the previous decision was legally sufficient, and then back benefits uh, that you might be awarded on a successful second claim cannot go back past the time period that the previous judge said no to, if that makes sense. So it definitely oh okay. Back. The I was not of aware of that. That you can get, yeah, that's right. You, in other words, you can't, in a second case, ask a second judge to reopen and give you benefits on a previously denied claim. It, for, in, it's sort of the civil side version of why you cannot be tried twice for the same crime. In other oh, words, oh, great point. Uh, these decisions have to be final at some point, and, and the way they look at it is, is if an ALJ turned it down and you didn't appeal, then legally speaking, you have accepted that outcome. That doesn't mean you agree with it, but mm -hmm. you, but mm -hmm. you, but legally speaking, that decision is sufficient and it bars any attempt to, to sort of reinvade that territory, so to speak, in a, in a new claim. Okay. Um, last thing I want to communicate to listeners out there is even if you've got a, a Social Security representative, attorney or non-attorney working on your case, it's going to be completing these forms for you, um, what Carl is going to share with you will help you understand what you need to communicate in those forms, uh, which is basically the answers to the questions that you're going to be asked, because 
one way or another, this information has got to be delivered to Social Security. So you're not off the hook um, if you've got like a full service representative that says, oh, I'll do the forms for you. Okay, so listen up and let's roll forward. So we want to start with um, form SSA3373. Is there any layman's lingo or it's just going to show up like this? And well, they'll call it the function report. That's the title, you know, at the top of it. So sometimes they will call it the the function report. That's usually what they would say if they were calling you about forms. Okay. So, so Carl, you just guide me through where you'd like me to go on the form and what's going to be important to communicate uh, to our audience. All right. Well, let me let me do a couple of general comments first, okay, about all of these forms in general and why we're even talking about them today. Uh, you know, and the first thing I want to acknowledge is, uh, you know, I have a close family member who's applying for disability and the nature of his disability is such that I ended up doing a lot of this for him. Uh, and so I, I will acknowledge right off the bat, they are a serious pain in the neck. Okay, there's a lot of questions. Uh, frankly, uh, a lot of them feel and, and really are uh, redundant, and this is actually important. We'll talk about it here in a few minutes, but they kind of do ask the same question over and over again. Uh, we all know what it's like psych psychologically to have somebody asking you the same question over and over again is that you get annoyed by it, and if you're like me, when you're annoyed about something, uh, you blow it off. Uh, so I found I found myself resisting the temptation uh, in completing these forms for this family member of mine to uh, the second or third time a question came down the pike to sort of get less and less clear because it's a serious pain in the neck. Because uh, you know these three forms we're talking about today, I think every single one of them ask you to talk about your work history. Every single one of them ask you to, um, uh, to, to, in some way or another, to describe your disability, I think, except for the, the uh, work history report. So, and even this first one we're talking about, the function report, I think, frankly, in some ways, it asks the same question four or five or six times, just with mm -hmm. different words. I personally don't believe that that's uh, unintentional. Yeah, uh, you I know, the first thing that comes to mind, sorry to interrupt, is that no, you okay. know I, I, I'm, I'm sure parents out there can relate to this. That if you have a child that wants something, they just keep asking the same question <laughs> over and over and over. It's kind of like Social Security. <laughs> uh, unlike most children who are doing that, though, however, your child is usually not setting you up uh, to make an inconsistent statement. Now, there are some kids smart enough to do that. <laughs> uh, but but uh, especially as they start be, you know get a little older like be teenagers and stuff like that um, yeah yeah I doubt that their true intent is sort of exactly nefarious uh, or evil or anything like that but uh, you know these forms stink as far as I'm concerned I right. to be honest all the time I spend working on these cases I've really not actually personally interacted with one of these forms in probably 15 years at the level of actually helping fill it out because uh, you know I have a law office with other people that do that kind of stuff so I don't I'm not personally hands-on doing it so my experience with my family member was the first time uh, that I'd actually really looked at one of these things the way I looked at it to fill it out uh, and I mean the very first reaction I had was this is just a big pain in the you know what mm -hmm. uh, so I think you need to 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 sort of have a Zen mind, if that makes any sense to people, when you come to this, because it's it's going to be annoying. Okay. Uh, you have to take the time with it, though, because uh, everything we're going to talk about here, I'm not going to really. I have a couple of specific comments with respect to specific questions, but really, I'm trying to convey an attitude. Um, okay. You know, I think the biggest mistake that people make on these, uh, aside from uh, rushing through it because people don't like filling out forms, people don't like answering questions three, four different times. 
I mean, I think the other thing is that the people are just too nice, and people uh, they don't like to complain. Now we all know, uh, you know, any of us that have done this kind of work uh, for a long time uh, have met a lot of people who love to complain. But by and large, most people don't. And so, what I see on these forums, you know, looking back, at, uh, you know, and thinking about it, getting ready for. Uh, this conversation today is really two extremes, uh, making mountains out of molehills and making molehills out of mountains. Uh, very simply, all I'm saying is people who exaggerate their problems and people who underplay their problems. Uh, and who I'm talking to today primarily are people who underplay them because that's really most people. Most people don't like to complain. Most people are kind of optimistic. It makes no sense to me because I'm not. But you know, most people are. And so when you look at these forms, for instance, a lot of them are, a lot of the questions on, for instance, this form that we're talking about now are stated in terms of yes or no answers. Right? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll scroll down to some of them here. So look on um, page, uh, just even, I think just page two, page two, page three. Page okay. four, page five, all of them, yes or no? Yep, yep. So question six, seven, eight, do you take care of pets or animals? Okay. All of that, yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. Okay, mm -hmm. now, so here's, here's the problem you get put into on this, okay? And, and this is why you need to be proactive when you're filling these forms out, okay? If you say yes to everything, you sound like you're exaggerating. If you say no to everything, it sounds like there's nothing wrong with you. And the truth is always, usually I should say, going to be in between yes or no. And what I suggest to people in, in, in our own cases, what we do, because uh, we do help people fill out you know, their applications in my administrative practice, is we don't, we don't fall for a yes or no answer. We just write sometimes or often or usually. Oh, so you can, you can change that. You don't have to put yes or no. You can do anything no. you want. You know, that's the thing. That's what I'm saying about the psychology of the form. The psychology uh -huh. of the form bring, puts these to you as yes or no questions when the simple fact is that most of these answers are in, most of these questions are incapable of a yes or no answer. Because mm -hmm. they don't want to know if you ever uh, let's see, uh, on page two, take care of someone else, such as a wife, husband, children, or grandchildren. They, whether yep, you ever right here. have done that ever is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. okay? what, what's relevant is, in one of these cases, is I imagine most people know by now, if they're even at the pretty much at the beginning of the process, you know that the standard of disability is not whether you can ever do anything. It's whether you can on a regular and continuous basis, eight hours a day, five days a week, what kind of functions can you do in that context? All right, so now let's say you check, yes, I take care of people. Yes, I take care of pets. Yes, uh, uh, you know, again, I, I'm sort of repeating myself, but I, I'm, I'm not going to apologize for it because this is the biggest problem that people with the way people fill these forms out, is they accept the premise of the form. There is no so, yes or no answer to most of these questions. So yes would be, would yes be all the time and no would be never? And if you take well, care it of depends. Well, it depends on the question, okay, because they don't, you know, you have to read the question. Okay, so do the illnesses, injuries, or conditions you have affect your sleep? That's question number 11, page 2, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the quote-unquote good answer for a disability claim is to say yes to that, of course, if it's true. On the other hand, if you say yes I, uh, to number seven, do you take care of anyone else, such as wife, husband, children, parents, whatever, an unexplained yes to that question, number seven, sounds kind of like, it's starting to sound kind of like somebody who's able to do stuff. The point of these forms is to give a very accurate picture of your day-to-day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day functioning. 
I think people mm -hmm. interact with these forms on the uh, on the premise that they offer, which is kind of a do you ever do any of these things ever? And I don't I don't buy that. I don't believe that's the right way to ask the question. They rarely uh, they rarely ask you to explain, for instance, well, they don't at all ask you to, they don't give you the choice of saying, well, sometimes I can do them and sometimes I can't. And so you have to take this upon yourself to know that that is a perfectly legitimate answer to say, sometimes, not usually, hardly ever, whatever, the, the actual truthful answer. I'm not here today to, to tell people how to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that that you have to think about, okay, so you sit there and you listen, you read this question, do you do you take care of anyone else, such as a wife, husband, children, grandchildren, parents, other? Okay, number seven. Now, of course, in one sense, the answer to that question is yes or no, but, but the real question is, how often do you do this? How often are you actually able to do this? It may be, in fact, true that last summer, you were feeling a little better and it just so happened that that was when you know your your mom was sick too and you were able to participate in helping her out okay so literally then the answer to that question is yes but that doesn't really tell the whole story no it doesn't. and the forms need to tell the whole story now, I've talked to literally thousands of claimants over the years I've prepped you know I've been at somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, 18, 19,000 hearings where I prep my own clients. And the most common story I hear is some version of a good day, bad day story. You know, that some days I'm able to do stuff, some days I'm not, because some days my pain isn't so bad as other days, or some days I'm not as depressed or anxious as I am on other days, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so of course, on a day when you're feeling better, if you have any sense of responsibility at all or even gratitude to the people that do things for you that you're going to try to take care of things when you're able to all right but that's not the complete answer the complete answer is well sometimes I do sometimes I don't so would it would an acceptable answer um, also be like you know if you if you take care of somebody else um, uh, could it be once a month or two times in the last 12 months? That's yeah, that that's right. The point is to be clear. Okay. You know, it, it, it's not to, because here's why this matters. All right, let's just stick with this same question we've been talking about, take care of somebody else. All right, this is a big problem with younger women that are applying for disability. You know, mm -hmm. If you're in your 30s or 40s and you've got children, mm. all right, uh, one of the things, and it's it's actually it's a very legitimate question. Uh, you know, you're, you're taking care of chil you have children in your home. Uh, nobody's going to believe you if you say I just lay there all day and I don't get them food and I don't change their diapers and I don't get up when there's a fight. And I mean, it, of course you do. All right, nobody, but. What people, but so if someone wants to just say yes to that question, but the, and that's what they usually do say, without talking about things like yes, but uh, I get a lot of help. You know, my sister, my mom, my mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the father uh, helps. Okay, because you know this is especially egregious with respect to to women who are raising children alone, because you know. It's just completely unfair that a judge would take that person's ability to to do a decent job of raising their children and use that against them when in many cases, let's say hypothetically the father has also applied for benefits, he can legitimately say, uh, I never do nothing res with respect to children. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, so point being, okay, the answer to that question whether you take care of someone like a wife or a husband and children. Children, taking care of children is a very emotional thing for women and they don't want to admit that they need help because they don't want to feel like a bad mom and that kind of stuff. And it's very reasonable to feel that way. But remember what you're doing here. You're not here to win Mother of the Year awards. 
you're here to explain exactly what's going on and to explain how that as a good mom, you've recognized that sometimes you can't take care of your child and so you've made other arrangements with your mother or with your sister or your friend or whatever to make sure that your kids are well taken care of. So this is just one example that I'm blowing up on purpose to kind of make my point that okay. people should take two or three times longer to fill these forms out than they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is great info. Now, I have a question for you, kind of yeah. uh, going going back up here to uh, question five, uh -huh. um, and this yeah. seems to be to be like the most important question. They're asking you why you can't work. Yep. And here here's what I want to bring to your attention. When we go through our process and our advocates are on the phone, we always ask this question. We say, explain to me why you can't work any job five days a week, 40 hours a week. And the common answer is, I've got fibromyalgia, depression, I can't sleep. Right. Um, which is unfortunate, but that doesn't get a case approved. So my understanding here is you need to express, you know, limitations um, is to get a case through the system. Is this where that story should start to be communicated? Say that again. I'm sorry. There, there was a little bit of a there was a noise in the background. It so just okay. say that last sentence. Well, I guess what I'm saying is is this where they're um, communicating their limitations that are on their body that prevent them from being able to work should start to be uh, communicated. So, for example, instead of saying I've got fibromyalgia and depression, and I can't sleep. Um, you know, I can only sit for 15 minutes. I can only stand for 10. I'm not able to lift a gallon of milk, and you know that type, that, that type of okay, yeah, information. Well, here's this is my feeling about this section, and and one of the little notes I had made to myself, you know, to, you know, sort of my talking points, so to speak, for this okay. conversation today, is uh, I, I look at this section, <clears throat> excuse me, the same way as I look at how each one of these forms has a big page at the end that just says remarks, okay? Where it says, oh, do you, is there anything else that you want to tell us, all right? I'm not a big fan of saying much of anything in those big white spaces they give, okay? So what I think as far as, okay, how do your illnesses, injuries, or conditions limit your ability to work, I think that, again, you know, I can't give a one-size-fits-all answer, but I would say less is more. I think I would say, personally, I would say something like, you know, as I explain in this form, uh, I cannot maintain, I mean, I'm thinking out loud as, I, as I'm saying it, but, you know, as I've explained throughout this form, I'm not able from day to day to predict how I'm going to feel or how I'm going to be able to function. Okay. So that I'm, clearly, that I'm clearly a big less is that, more. I don't okay. want like uh, three thousand words on why you're disabled at all, and 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 I don't want clients, for instance, filling out extra rem remarks at all. I mean, this it's certainly reasonable to have some answer to this question number five that you've pointed out. Okay. But I'll tell you, it's like uh, it's like Murphy's law or something that. If you're going to get bit on the you-know-where, it's going to be in from the remarks section. In other words, oh. it's going to be on the in the section where they gave you enough rope to hang yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not so a big fan. Is this si is go ahead. Sorry. Something as simple as saying, you know, my limitations don't allow me to work five days. Yeah, a week, I'm a big hours. fan of right that 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 look. You know, what what's this about really? This is about. Uh, how do they keep me from working? They keep me from working because I don't know from one day to the next how much I'm going to be able to do, how long I'm going to be able to do it, mm -hmm. uh, when I can start doing it, when I'm going to have to finish doing it. And, you know, again, I'm a big fan of general. And I don't okay. even mind, by the way, you know, the answer you gave initially, uh, the way that this hypothetical person filled out that answer. If someone wants to say uh, that, I, I uh, have uh, severe fibromyalgia pain and and I'm depressed a lot. I mean, I think that's I think that's fine. Yep. 
I, I, what, I'm really a big fan of like I think the way you guys say this, if I remember in your in your training, is like something like explain to me in three sentences or something like that. Is that how you two sentences or less? Two if it's over, the gong's going to go off. Yeah, I'm. I think this is a good place to use that rule. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because. Um, yeah, you should be able to communicate it, and it makes it simple for everybody. Okay, awesome. All right. What's next, Carl? Is there, is there more to this? I mean, I'm not... Well, let me go familiar. go back up to number six, the oh, most six. absurd question on the, on oh, okay. the, on the questionnaire. Okay, okay, describe what you do from uh, the time you wake up until going to bed, and they give okay. you three lines. Okay? <laughs> I mean, to cover honestly, your day. I think that I think that a perfectly reasonable response to that, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, uh, is to say C below, because they ask you this general question, then they ask you a million little specific questions that are basically all about daily activities. So it doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. Um, C below. And again, here's, you know. There's sort of a line here that you need to walk. I mean, you you have to understand that you have to be giving information in these forms that's helpful, all right? By the same token, I think that any open-ended question is one best avoided as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. It's a lot easier. I mean, look, these questions that are very specific, like take care of people or take care of pets or help care for animals, uh, how's your sleep, all this kind of stuff like you're seeing in 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, et cetera. These are all very specific questions, very, very similar to the kind of questions that people get asked in the hearing. You know, at the hearing, if you have to go to one, the judge is not going to sit back in his chair and say, okay, tell me all about yourself. He's going to say, do you take care of pets? Do you take care of uh, other people? Do you, do you have trouble sleeping? Are you able to dress and bathe, et cetera? That's how a hearing works. They, they do not ask you to, to, uh, uh, to write your life story or to, to give a speech about your life story. They ask you little questions that have little answers. And I believe, intentionally or not, that all these open-ended questions uh, whether they mean for them to or not, I know for a fact because I've seen it a million times that these open-ended questions are the ones that uh, that end up screwing people yeah. up. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, um, I'm looking uh, page six. Now I'm just got some general. I think page six is where I go next. What yeah. number question is that, Carl? Am I looking at the right one? I think so. Number six. Question number six. Oh, question number six. Yeah. Oh, right yeah. here. Describe what you can do from the time you get up, time you go to bed. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I mean page six. Okay. So now, a lot of this, as we're scrolling through quickly, are just, again, all the same rule that we've been talking about here just applies. That okay. Sometimes, usually, hardly ever, et cetera, are perfectly good substitute answers, and and I wouldn't check yes or no. I would write in bold over those boxes my real answer to that. So, for instance, uh, question 15, where you are right now, uh, drive a car. When you, uh, oh, actually, it doesn't even ask you whether you. It's just asking you whether you do or not. Uh, Okay. So, oh. okay. If no, when going out, can you go alone? That's that sub C right there on question. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the answer to that is, uh, let's say, uh, sometimes, and then you get to explain. Okay. So you do something like this. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, their yes or no thing is frankly just a bunch of nonsense. Hopefully, they can write better than you can. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> And you know, my, my regular oh, oh, penmanship is not far off from this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like a three-year-old wrote it, but maybe, you know. Uh, but, but look, sometimes is the, again, if you can go out alone all the time, then the answer is yes, okay? But if the answer is sometimes I can and sometimes I can't, then the answer is sometimes. It's just that simple. That's, that's really, in some ways, 
the primary message that I'm giving today, and I know mm -hmm. we're spending mm -hmm. a lot of time on it, but but you're going to be tempted to just skip through this stuff. Now That's right. Down. Well, time is money. I mean, this is going to save people thousands of dollars. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Page six. This is my, one of my other favorite questions. All right. Let and, me get cleaned up here, and then we'll. Oh, you have to knock it off before you can move from the page. Yeah, it helps. Um, okay. So we're going down. I'm on seven now. Should I go? Is it hobbies? I want to go to page six. Page six. So page. this shows me as page six, but it includes the no, two at the cover bottom. Pages. At the bottom, it, it, its own number, not your number. Oh, I gotcha. Okay, yeah. thank you. That's helpful. Okay. okay, there's page six. All right. All right. Uh, where are we? Oh, yes. Uh, this was. Uh, do you have any problems getting along with family, friends, neighbors, or others? <laughs> um, now, here's the thing. I just want to say about that. Okay. Again, you know, you need to go slow here. Okay, and throughout all of these, and most of them are fairly, uh, well, let me put it this way. I'll compare, right down below, you'll see all those boxes, okay? Um, check any items that your illnesses, injuries, or conditions affect. Very simple. Does it or doesn't it affect your ability to lift? If it does at all, the answer is yes. Squatting, et cetera. Completing mm -hmm. tasks, et cetera. Pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But this, do you have any problems getting along with family, friends, or others? I don't know how many times I've seen that answered as no. Uh, when you know my case is that the client, for instance, you know, this is gonna, I'm just going to use a hypothetical. My client has said no, but my client has anxiety and depression, and isolates, uh, is, let's say, somewhat agoraphobic in the sense that they don't like to leave their house. They get more anxious when they have to leave, etc. But they've said no to this question because what they think it means is. Do you have any problem getting along? Is they they think it means do I get into fights with people? All right, do I argue with people? Do I hit people over the head with things? Uh, when in fact, uh, there's all kinds of ways to have problems getting away with people or getting along with people. And one of one of the most common ones is people that just don't want to be around people at all. It is a problem if you are isolating, if you are uh, anxious around people, if you avoid social situations, that's just as much a quote unquote problem, close quote, mm -hmm. getting along with people as uh, fighting with them is. Mm -hmm. right? So you, again, you, you, you kind of have to think about these things a little bit, but this is one that I very frequently see. And, and the point of all this is, you know, at least from my point of view, from the federal court standpoint, I don't know how many times I've seen uh, decisions where the judge says, well, the client testified that she avoids people and blah, 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 but uh, in her form that she filled out, she said she had no trouble getting, she had no problems getting along with people. Back to okay. consistency. Right. Yeah. That's right. And well, oh, no. really incompleteness, really, and and also just kind of thinking about what the forms are actually asking for. Okay. Yeah. Right? It's becoming clear how you can get tripped up when you get to a hearing. Right. I don't know of anybody that really truthfully gets along with all their friends and neighbors. They may answer <laughs> that and say yes, but. Uh. Well, and the, and this is the classic example too of. You know, look, not everybody who's anxious or depressed, for instance, they're not always isolating. They're not always, like, jittery or mm. or start sweating when they get around people. I mean, in fact, in a lot of I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and maybe what do I know? But truthfully, if you offered me being blind, in other words, a permanent, well-defined impairment, versus not knowing from one day to the next what the hell I was going to be able to do, Mm. Uh, I'll pick blind over that any day because at least I yeah. know that my deal tomorrow is I got to figure out how to write with my hand and yeah. to get around without being able to see. I mean that's a well-defined, you know, problem set. But not knowing if I could go somewhere on Saturday, I mean, uh, I you know I don't know that I understand how people cope with that any better than I did my first day on the job 30 years ago. I mean it's the worst that's a kind great of problem. Point. Yeah. It's Great the worst point. kind of problem to have, mm. Mm. I think.
<laughs> as far as this form specifically goes, again, I would just say, look, you're going to see that big fat page at the end with a lot of lines on it, uh, called where where the word remarks is at the top, and, it's, and it acts like it really wants to know. Okay, uh, do yourself a favor and believe what I'm just told you, what I'm about to tell you. Okay, which is that if you answer all of these questions up above, uh, up above here, which go into how you're able to manage activities of daily living, if you answer them completely and accurately, in other words, tell them, I mean, I'm just going to assume that every person who's listening to this uh, has a valid claim for disability. Okay, I'm, For the sake of what I'm about to say, I'm going to assume your claim is value, valid. Okay, then. If you're like 95% of the people who apply for disability, you know the issue is not going to really be whether you always can or always can't do most of these things. It's going to be more about that. The sometimes you can, sometimes you can't thing. Okay, so if you've gone through all the above and you've given very accurate information about how, you know, sometimes I can do these things, sometimes I can't, et cetera, et cetera, then you do not need to say anything else. Okay. There's lots of stories I could tell, you know, good jokes that I could tell about somebody who just said one thing too many, okay? But, you know, but my favorite one is, you know, the criminal defense lawyer gets up in a case where he's defending a guy accused of biting somebody's ear off. And he notices in the testimony that the guy had never actually said that um, he saw the guy bite the other guy's ear off. So he gets up all blustery and says, well, I happen to notice, sir, that you never actually said you saw my client bite uh, the plaintiff's ear off. Uh, well, how can you even be here today accusing my client? And the answer, of course, was, uh, well, I saw him spitting it out. <laughs> okay, so there's always that danger of just saying too much. And I'm telling too much. you, you know, you, you get to the end here. Think about it twice, three, four, five times before you put anything in there because I promise you what they really, really want to know is everything that they've already asked you in the questions up above. And if you've given them good answers to that, you've done a great job. Don't try to gild the lily, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Don't ask, don't even ask for sympathy, you know, as tempting as that might be. You know, sign the thing and, and get it back to them. Can you leave it blank? Of course you can, because it's it's optional. Okay. Um, All right. I would say uh, that would be what I'd have to say about that form, and I'd like to look at the work history report, and I promise you that that won't be anywhere near as uh, long okay. as what we're saying, what we've done already. But you've really shared the strategy, I believe, is what we're getting at today. So okay, so now we're on to form. 3369, the work history report. Yeah. All right. All right, here, there's just a couple of things here, all right? And, and to be honest, uh, here's how all of you out here can think about this. If, you, if you're under 50 years old and you're not even close to 50 years old, this form is practically meaningless to how your case is going to be decided. I mean, you still need to complete it, you still need to try, et cetera. But mainly, what I'm, who I'm talking to now are people who are very close to 50 years old or over 50 and into their 50s or 60s, because that's when work history really matters in these cases. To very briefly summarize, okay, when you're under 50 years old, uh, Social Security standard, in a nutshell, is that you have to prove basically that uh, there's no job at all out there that you can do uh, on, on a full-time basis. No matter how dumb the job is, uh, no matter you know how silly it is, whatever, whether you want to do it or not, et cetera, basically Social Security wins, so to speak, if there's any dumb job out there that you can do. For the Greeter at Walmart, way. ticket taker at a movie theater, parking garage attendant, nothing like yeah, that. Yeah, Maytag right? repairman, yeah, I yep. mean, uh, everything, everything. Now, when the, the world starts uh, bending in your favor a little bit when you're getting close to 50 and, and certainly when you're over 50 and 55 years old, and that's where these answers can 
uh, and so I think there's a couple things here that I think are important. Number one is they ask for your job title. I don't advise claimants to actually try to give a job title. Uh, I know that, you know, because there's a form, you think you have to to say. My point about job title is is that it's one of the sort of esoteric things about Social Security disability that ultimately they're going to have to figure out what was your job title. But they're going to use this thing that uh, this document or this book, I should say, that the Department of Labor uh, came up with 30 years ago called the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. They're going to compare your description of these jobs to this book. Believe it or not, the government spent millions of hours literally trying to come up with a list of every freaking job out there, okay? And they assigned all of them a number, and Social Security specifically says in the regulations that that's sort of the gold standard for how we're going to, you know, we can't just have uh, people saying, I'm quote unquote an assembler, because that doesn't really tell anybody whether you assemble space shuttles or Happy Meals, okay? So, so I don't get into, I don't, I don't want my clients saying too much in terms of quote unquote job title. So what I would say is that for instance, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One is because no matter what you say, they're going to end up saying something different anyway. So let's say you worked in a restaurant. Let's say uh, you were a cook in a restaurant. I think it's okay to say restaurant worker, and I'll tell you why because for for a couple reasons but mainly because nobody's almost nobody is just a cook a chef may only only ever cook food a cook in most restaurants is going to basically you know they're going to be cleaning they're going to be uh, putting stock on the shelves or they they might even be washing dishes they might be prepping food they might be making ordered food lots of different things and that can how that case ends up getting I'm sorry how that job ends up getting described can really matter so all I'm saying is this is that if you worked in a restaurant then just tell them you worked in a restaurant because what you're gonna see here in the next let's say number one is your answer is restaurant worker okay now if you go to page two you'll see that you're then going to be required to take your answer to um, to that number, to question number one, uh, go back, uh, there you are. If you go, you look now, you're going to be asked to describe all the duties of job title number one dash restaurant worker, okay? And then, look, you're going to, right there, you uh, right at the very, almost the top of the page, it's going to say, describe this job. What did you do all day? And this is what I'm getting to, is that people want to say, I cooked food. If you really only ever cooked food as a cook in a restaurant, then that's what you should say. I'm, again, I'm not certainly coaching anybody here to, to, to lie or something like that. But I also know how the world of work is. I've had real jobs. I have teenage and adult sons that have real jobs. I've been paying attention as I walk around in the world. And I don't think very many people, for instance, who cook food in a restaurant only cook food. And so you want to write down every single thing you did, even if you'd only done it a few times or even if you only done it once a month. Okay, so if you cook mostly every day, but you also had to wash some dishes, you also had to mop up the floor, you also had to stock some shelves. And let's say once a month um, there was a, a delivery and, and so you, you spent several hours that day just making sure all the stuff was in the freezer or maybe you were asked to do inventory of what was in the freezer. You put down everything that you ever did in that job, ever. Okay, you need to put down on there something that you would have to do if you were asked to do it. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, people who are, uh, what do you call them, um, uh, home nursing people, people who come and 
usually all they ever do is they come over to the old person's house. Mm -hmm. They maybe cook them some food. They maybe uh, 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 do some laundry for them or, or watch TV with them or, you know, again, I don't want to, people know that what that kind of job is. For the most part, it's a pretty non-physical job. Uh, you know, in other words, you, you're not going to have to pick up anything heavy. Uh, you can probably sit a fair amount of the time while you're doing the job. But, and I had a client one time here recently, just to use an example, where the, you know, the, the vocational person in the hearing described that as a light job. And so I asked that person, the vocational witness, I said, well, let me ask you a question. If my client came in and Mrs. Smith had fallen and she couldn't get up. Uh, are you saying that that a person performing a home nursing job that uh, that they would just simply leave and wait for somebody else to get that lady up off the floor? That's a good the one. The answer, of course, is no. That wouldn't be true at all. Okay, so this matters a great deal in these cases, and it's a lot to to kind of try to explain all at once. But the bottom line is that you want them to know every single task that you ever did or would be expected to do. Another one is, for instance, people who work as cashiers in stores or in convenience uh, uh, marts um, almost never remember that in the winter uh, part of their job is going to be to mop up all the uh, slop that's coming in through the door on people's boots. Uh, and to throw down salt, um, which, by the way, most bags of that weigh 30 or 40 pounds. Um, now, if they're filling out this form in July, they're going to completely forget that they have to do that when it's December. You can't afford to forget that. Okay? These these requ these questions about your job are not a request to ask you to describe in some sort of general average way what you're required to do. What, they're, what, they're, what they need to know is every single thing you have to do in this job, even if it's only very, very infrequently. Because it Great can make point. a big difference to how these cases are decided. So if you look down a little bit further on this page that we're on right now where it starts talking about um, check weights lifted and uh, when it gets into the weight question, how much do you have to lift in these jobs? Right here, Carl? Um, yeah. Even though the word heaviest is in bold, I just don't know how many times I've had people say, for instance, my nursing, my home nursing lady checked on this form. She checked that uh, it was less than 10 pounds uh, because most of the time, all she was doing was lifting bowls of soup and and uh, and laundry, right? Mm -hmm. So she filled less than probably she said ten pounds. So I asked her a question during the hearing, you know, that I described before. If Ms. Smith had fallen and couldn't get up, are you saying you would just be able to leave? Are you saying your job wouldn't? Would you would you keep your job if you just left because you were you could only lift ten pounds? And the answer, of course, is no. Well, or I mean, the answer is she'd get fired. And of course she would be. So you have to remember, okay, that heaviest weight lifted is, by definition, it's asking for something that doesn't happen all that often. But if it ever happens, for instance, for that cashier in the convenience store, you have to remember that when winter rolls around, you might be rolling a, a big uh, 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 a bucket of sand around to, to, to treat the uh, drive or to treat the parking lot or or a big bag of salt, um, or pushing a shovel around, or whatever. You have to remember that, even if it's July. Because what they want to know is, what is the most demanding aspects of this job? Now, they, they also want to know the common things that you do. So you, again, you're not trying to be misleading, OK? The home nurse lady usually did not have to do anything all that strenuous. But she absolutely had to be able to do something stre uh, strenuous if the situation arose. Okay, so that's the point that, that I'm really drilling down on here: is that you've got to think in terms of everything.
that you ever had to do in the jobs that you've done. And, and remember also what's the most demanding thing that you ever had to do and, and could be asked to do again. Hmm. You might. Car go ahead. Sorry. I'm Quick probably question, just Carl. going on and on. About. No, that's all right. This is great. I'm just wondering, uh, for some um, jobs, there is a position description that's got everything. Is there any, I mean, can you just attach that, or do you actually have to fill these forms? You have to, would actually have to write it in on a form. You mean or, you're saying if you have, like, a, like if your former company has a job description for your job? Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are awesome because actually those, that's even what made me start thinking about this was when I was writing job descriptions for the people's positions here. It kind of surprised me how many different things I might be tempted to ask my own employees to do. Okay. I mean, I'm never going to ask them to shingle the roof or something, but you know what I mean? Like I just really it didn't dawn on me until I made a list, you know, how many different things they did. So I understand why you forget, and I also understand why you're in a hurry because these forms really stink, you know, because they're a pain in the neck to do. Uh, yeah. But you, but you, you, you rush through them at your own, you know, at your own uh, peril. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so again, um, attaching a um, a position description or a job description is uh, can that be done? And yeah, because I think that's actually those are usually the best. If, if most people don't have one, but if you have one, that's actually um, and you, of course read it, you know, because you. I'm sure mine isn't accurate anymore. I wrote them two years ago. I probably added some things in, so you may need to look at it and say, oh, yeah, well, this is true as far as it goes, but it forgot to add in that now I have to do X, Y, Z. Okay. But, yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, those, Great. those are usually very comprehensive. Yeah. Great. Great. Good stuff. This, what, also, what this whole form also has another remarks section, uh, again, which is just best avoided under any circumstances. But if you look through just these forms in general, again, it's just a matter of this form in, in general. Especially if you've had a lot of jobs, this thing's going to take you a long time to do right. You just mm -hmm. make yourself take a long time to do it right. Trust me. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, You're doing yourself potentially a real big favor. Is uh, there, um, I mean, what, would it be a sound strategy to just skim through these whole forms, all, the whole form before you start filling things out? I think so. Yeah, it's a good point. I hadn't thought of it, but yeah, that's a good point. Okay. So the oh, same and the other thing I meant to say about these forms is, uh, you know, and you don't need to scroll all the way back up, uh, Brian, but, you know, right at the very beginning they talk about, like, your dates of employment. Um, that's one place where I would not get super jammed up on, uh, you know, remembering things exactly. I mean, if you know, some people just know things like that, and other people really don't think that way. You know, they couldn't, mm -hmm. you know, they can barely remember their anniversary date, you know, and things like that. Um, you know, approximations are okay there, as is, I don't remember or not sure, okay? And here's why that's okay. And this is the the thing that most clients don't know is that Social Security can produce what's called a detailed earnings query uh, with no trouble whatsoever. It's one of the forms that their database can generate literally in a second where they can look at not only just a summary of your earnings record where how much did you make every year for the last 30 years, but they can also look at um, an exploded version of your earnings that shows who your employers were. Okay, so they're not very dependent on you in terms of being exact about these dates. Okay, if there's any question whatsoever about what dates you worked anywhere, um, and you say I'm just not sure, then they they have an instamatic re, uh, research tool that allows them to sort that out if it's if it's even relevant. And and, okay. and frankly, most of the time it isn't. All right. Great. Um, oh, yeah, here's another thing here, okay, uh, that I forgot about until I read my own notes. Um, people, 
I don't know what this is. I don't know if it's selective memory or pride or just, you know, being inexact. I'm not sure. But I've had a lot of many, many, many times over the years. Okay, going back, Brian, I'm sorry, to um, right to that very next page where we have that job title one description. Okay, right there at the top, it, it uh, talks about rate of pay and hours per day and hours per week. Okay. I mean, literally thousands of times, I'm sure, hundreds and hundreds of times, more than a thousand times, repeatedly, so many times that it's impossible to forget. I will look at job title number one, and the information filled in there, you know, might say something like, I made $12 an hour, I worked five uh, days a week, and I worked eight hours a day. Okay, so, you know, that would tell you that that person uh, if you looked at their earnings record for those that job for those years, that they would should be making somewhere in the neighborhood of about twenty six thousand dollars a year, right? If they're working five hours a day, eight hours, I'm sorry, five days a week, eight hours a day, twelve dollars an hour. I'll and try I don't know how many times. That. Well, I'm sure I'm pretty close to right. Point being that I don't know how many times I go and I compare this job title at uh, ABC restaurant. And I go over to the earnings record, uh, and I see, and I look at the number there, and I, the number that's looking back at me is like four thousand dollars that the person made that year. Okay, um, you need to be if you don't know or you don't remember, it, that's a way better answer than just poking and hoping and 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 just sort of making things up. And I don't mean making things up like lying. I just mean, you know putting something in there out of some obligation to fill in a blank piece on a form, okay? If you don't know, you don't know, okay? But what, you know, judges many times look at that like, you know, uh, that this person is either not even trying to be accurate or if that they're outright, like, just don't even, you know, know how to testify accurately, okay? I mean, it doesn't help one's credibility times. if you don't have to... Yeah, it really doesn't. You know, and uh, and you know, you cannot, you can't be uncredible saying I don't know. I guess is the best way of saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you can't be uncredible to say I don't know unless the, the question is what's your name. Okay. Uh, that that you could probably be found not credible for not for saying that you don't know your own name, but but for not knowing exactly how much you made it and how many days a week you were working at a job you held 17 years ago, um, I, I don't think so. So if you don't know, you don't know, okay? And that's a way better answer, or I can't remember anyway. It's a way better answer than these wild guesses that people, I think, that's probably mostly what it is. It's just wild guesses yep. that they throw in here. And it may be some sense of pride of, like, I don't want to look like a bum. Okay, because I only worked at this job part time. You know, these forms are not a time for your pride to really have much to do with anything. Okay, what you need to be proud about is that you filled these forms out accurately. Not that you know, again, you're not trying to win employee of the year here. Okay. Mhm. Mm mhm. Okay. Huh. Nice. All right. Anything that else on harsh, these? I apologize. No, I think I'm. You know, to be honest. Uh, uh, I, I will just say briefly, okay, that this last form that you tabbed, um, frankly, it just is largely redundant of the other two, uh, which again, I can't imagine isn't super frustrating. Uh, it talks about work history, it talks about education, uh, it talks about, it has the job description information. Um, all I'm saying, to any of this form is the same things that I said to the other two, okay, which is be entirely accurate, uh, admit it when you don't know, I think that's a big one, and with respect to this job description information, you have to be consistent here. If you took my advice on the work history report form that we just got through talking about, then take it again with respect to this form, because this one comes right back to, the, for God knows why, to the exact same list of questions about um, how you did your past job. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So fill it out accurately. Most people do fill out, fill out their medical treatment information accurately. Okay? Uh, maybe my big complaint there isn't so much accuracy as much as completeness. I think people tend to focus on what they're doing now and, and don't bother as much necessarily with the historical information. But other than that, you know, this form is uh, uh, one that's sort of a combination of um, both of the two things that we just talked about and usually gets used at the recon level in mm -hmm. states that there is a recon. Okay. So it's sort of a short form of the other two that they use at that second level of appeal after an initial denial. All right. And by the way, what Brian said before is, is true. Okay. If you've been denied initially and you're in a state where now they are going to quote unquote reconsider, uh, it's the absolute misnomer of all time. Right? To, to describe what they do at that second level of appeal as a reconsider anything. Uh, most states, um, the denial rate on reconsideration is over 90%. So in other words, if you lost initially, you're going to lose again, most times. God bless you if you're the exception. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Okay, but my point here is now you're at recon. Now you're filling out this amalgam type of form here, uh, the the 3368. Uh, don't undo everything that you accomplished by by giving good solid information the first time around by skimping on this second one. Okay, you need to do exactly the same thing the second but you'd be better off just ignoring them when they ask for this form than you would be uh, to fill it out in a pardon my French in a half assed way. Okay. Okay. If, you, if you're not gonna French. fill it out completely <laughs> and put your full effort into it, then you're actually better off just never responding to their request for this information. Okay. And I actually do give that advice to claim. Okay. So these two forms, 3373, 3369, are, uh, are definite. Those are going to be filled out. And the last one is um, in states where there's reconsideration and if you've been denied, you may. Uh, right. By and large, that's where you're going to mostly. Now, they don't have, like, real firm rules about this. And to be honest, you, you know, you might get all three of these at initial level, which is completely idiotic. Okay. Okay. But the bottom line is, again, if you're going to send them all back, they all have to be sent back with this attention to detail and completeness and accuracy, accuracy that we've been talking about today, or uh, you risk two things. One is contradicting yourself from one form to the next, uh, or, uh, or, or just not creating, or, you know, or not being clear and complete in your responses in these forms, then later on down the line, because I've seen it, you get in a hearing, the judge says, well, back on your form that you filled out when you first filed your claim, it says here that uh, that you do blah, 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 and you, didn't, you did not say that you had any problems doing any of these things. Is that still true? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the question that you're afraid of. Because then now you're going to want to say, well, you know, I, I mean, I didn't really mean that. I, I was, I was, I was in a hurry, you know. And some judges will accept that. Uh, so I'm not saying uh, if you didn't do this right, then you're dead in the water. You know, there are ways to fix this, mm -hmm. uh, but the, better to not have to fix it in the first place. Great. Well, I just for those of you that are um, uh, watching now, I want to just if you follow. Uh, the screen um, below where the video is, you'll see there's the links to the three forms that we have here. So if you are in the application process and need the forms, and you can just click on this link and you'll be brought out to, and you can print these off. They're right here for you. Um, and uh, that'll be help you get your case going. So anything that you can think of in closing that we may have missed, uh, Carl? No, I don't want to keep repeating myself. I think it's just, again, back about uh, where, where, where we were in the beginning. You know, you cannot assume that these things won't be looked at, um, that 
you know, your first objective, and, and I'm certainly not someone who's ever taken, there are very, very good people at the local um, uh, Social Security office level and DDS level who really do care, who really want to make the right decision, who really try to do a good job. And giving this complete information helps them, those people do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but of course, you know, there's the other side of the coin of, you know, people who, uh, um, you know, who don't do a good job or whatever, and so now you're in a position where you're going to end up in front of a Social Security judge or, God forbid, uh, even further on into the process. Um, and, uh, you know, these things, uh, they're a matter of record. Uh, the judge will be able to see them. If we go to federal court, they'll be part of the, um, the complete record that the court uh, will, uh, will be looking at. If, uh, you know, if the government's attorney in, in those cases uh, sees a lot of inconsistencies between those forms and what you said in a hearing, for instance, uh, that's certainly going to be an obstacle that we're going to have to overcome. There's ways to do that. Um, better just not to have to. And, and by the way, Brian's very right that uh, as much as I enjoy helping the people I get to help at these federal court appeals that I do, um, he's absolutely right that you don't really want to ever meet me. Because, <laughs> because no, for real, you know, that, yeah. that, you know, by the time you get to me, you've already gone through an initial recon hearing uh, level you've probably already got two years or more into this case and Easy. the first thing I'm going to tell you is that you're probably looking at two more. Yep. Uh, yep. So look, what I do is very valuable and useful to those people who just run into walls, okay? Uh, but, but what we're trying to do with this meeting anyway is to just talk about how uh, ways that you don't have to put bricks in that wall yourself, okay? Exactly. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, great points, you know, but, uh, pay now, do it right, or pay later. That's really what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so listen, you, you've been very gracious with your time. You've spent over an hour with us here. Um, I want to uh, thank you on behalf of everybody out there. This was uh, absolutely priceless uh, information uh, for people going through the process. So uh, thank you for that. For those of you that are... Um, out there listening. Again, the forms will just scroll down there at the bottom of this page. Uh, please take the time. Uh, fill them out. Fill them out accurately. And uh, once you've got your disability case approved, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email into support at the Disability Digest. And um, we make a habit here to get up from our computers and do our uh, victory, uh, uh, disability approval victory dance. So we'd love to be dancing for you. So Carl, thank you once again.